Good morning, everyone. And welcome to the first Tuesday webinar. I've got just a little bit of business to attend to before we turn you over to our speaker today. So first of all, just so you have some faces here, I'm Nona Burling. I'm their facilitator, just basically introducer. We have two people here, Jeremy Stroud and Joe Olivar, who are our technical support. And um, they will generally put their information into the chat box. So if you have any difficulty, you can give one of them a call and they can help you sort it out. But our new software, Zoom, has had very little difficulty. So anyway, all right, next up, I just wanted to tell you that this webinar is sponsored by the Washington State Library, which is a division of the Office of Secretary of State. And our funding comes from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. At the end of the webinar, um, there's when you logged in, it opened up behind your, your webinar screen a tab on your browser that is a link to a survey. And the survey is something that we need to do for our IMLS money. So we really appreciate it. It's just four questions. It's really quick and pretty straightforward. So if you have a chance, we'd love it if you filled out that survey. And now I wanted to introduce Jessica Ann brought to you because I am very excited about this particular webinar. Jessica is a librarian at the Grand Rapids Public Library in Michigan. And we heard about her work all the way out here in Washington State. And I personally was really honored that she accepted our request. I think it's great to get new names and new faces. And she is clearly someone who is, well, we're not the only ones who look at her as a mover and shaker, as you will see. So Jessica, she always brings a high level of passion and enthusiasm to her job. During her first years as a librarian, she began the DigiBridge partnership between the Grand Rapids Public Schools and the um, Grand Rapids Library. And that resulted in her being named a library journal mover and shaker. So like I said, we're not the only ones who noticed her. <laughs> this past August, after serving as a branch manager, she was promoted to youth services manager and is already ensuring the library is at the forefront of early literacy services and programming. Jessica's on the board of directors for the Michigan Library Association, and she serves on ALA's Coretta Scott King Book Award Committee. She's one busy woman. <laughs> She's presented at national conferences on multiple topics. And now I'm going to stop talking and let Jessica take over because you didn't come here to hear me. You came here to her, hear her. So thanks, Jessica. It's all yours. Thank you so much, Nono. Uh, I'm really excited to be here uh, and to talk about um, race and story time. So I'm going to share my, my screen and we can get started. All right, so we are going to talk about race uh, and story time. And uh, as a professional librarian and a person of color, I wholeheartedly believe that story time librarians are instrumental in being facilitators of diversity and inclusion in the libraries, and especially for zero to five, um, and most notably in story times. Uh, so um, you can find me on Twitter at Whimsy Librarian. Uh, and if you want to tweet at all about this chat, then um, hashtag modeling inclusion. So just a little bit about me. Um, so I was really uh, fortunate that both sides of my family uh, are great um, historians on both sides. So from my, um, my maiden name is Liddell. And so my great, great, great grandmother was uh, born a slave in South Carolina in 1796. And then she was sold um, to the Liddell plantation in Georgia. Um, and so then after the Civil War, um, the story goes that the soldiers had to, um, she had a sons by the master, um, I'm sorry, sons by the master's son, and it took the soldiers to um, actually uh, facilitate the part of her family uh, leaving and being free. Um, so my dad uh, grew up in Mississippi, and um, him and my mother were both part of the Great Migration. If you haven't read Isabel Wilkerson's Warmth of Other Sons, I highly encourage that you do so. 
um, they were first generation uh, college graduates and their family um, and migrated to the north during that period um, in the early 1950s, uh, used the train, um, uh, the train to go to Chicago and um, uh, ended up making that their home. So um, both my parents uh, raised uh, my family, me and my brother on the south side of Chicago uh, during the early 90s. Uh, during the economic segregation and a gang warfare. And um, even though I was raised in this isolated neighborhood from um, resources, uh, I went to a school that was filled um, with resources. So that was always very, very fascinating and interesting to me. And so my mom made sure that uh, she felt the library in school, uh, we were never going to be represented. So she had to make double work that during the summer, um, during side projects on the school year that we were affirmed because I remember her telling at the library, you're not going to see them read a book about you. And so you're gonna have to learn about your identity and your culture uh, on your own time. So my mom poured her whole early childhood um, teaching career, she had double masters, um, into affirming our identities when we were growing up. Uh, and so I'm gonna go right into um, sort of the historical um, point of view that shapes sort of um, race uh, and talking about race and understanding the detrimental psychological effects of um, not talking about race. Um, so we know that in the whole Brown versus Board of Education, um, there was a husband and wife psychologist team, uh, Kenneth and uh, I think it's Marie Clark, and they did um, this doll test that Thurgood Marshall wanted presented um, to help um, everyone understand how awful segregation was and to champion the cause of integration. And we know um, in the book Brown's Wake, it's by um, Martha Minow, that um, even though it was like a footnote in the um, court transcripts, this was groundbreaking psychological um, a psychological study that uh, was just huge and infamous in the fact of uh, racial bias. And so my mom remembers in college of this just being like a hot topic item and her not even realizing at the time of how much this affected um, African American kids growing up. And we know that nowadays Harvard has done the project implicit uh, test where it's no longer just about race. There are studies about age, about gender, disabilities, and understanding uh, the implications of our our unconscious bias. Uh, so even though that there are way better tests, this is not the test that um, is the be all end all of uh, analysis on race. It is the one that started that conversation uh, nationwide uh, about um, the terrible effects and the insidiousness of um, the effects of segregation. So I would encourage you, if you haven't um, read anything about it or seen documentaries like The Eyes on the Prize, um, please do. Uh, and it'll help give you an understanding of when you aren't represented, when you aren't represented, um, in a mass uh, way, or when you're always playing um, with things that do not look like you. Uh, I think CNN, they did a, a, a new, like updated version of it, and it's still very, very fascinating. Um, so I'm using uh, myself as an example, but I've been to countless uh, workshops um, and uh, racial healing or social justice, uh, um, uh, conferences, whether it's with friends or with people that I'm that I do not know, and I've noticed that all of the people of color we have these eerily formulaic stories at this point of how we've all been affected by um, uh, our identity or the lack of talking about our identity from birth. Um, and so I want to just play this out in a big picture aspect before we get into the meat and the bones of the presentation um, of why when you see the hashtags, we need diverse books or own voices, um, why it's just so revolutionary. Um, and 
and it is because we have grown up so much not seeing ourselves as main characters. Um, for example, I went to go see the new Star Wars movie with my brother over Christmas, and we were watching the trailers, and he leans over to me, and he was like, Jessica, there are so many movies of people of color, and he was like, they're not stereotypes. He's like, could you imagine growing up being like, this is your introduction into uh, mainstream media? Um, and so it's always been fascinating to me, uh, like the two different worlds people of color have to code switch between um, and what we have to do to affirm our, ident our identities. Um, and so part of that, uh, I didn't realize um, until I was fortunate enough to travel. Um, and so it was funny to me when you go to Europe um, or South America and you have people who uh, have never met a black American before. And so they have so many questions. Um, and so you uh, may find it amusing. Um, and, and I did. And but it became very unamusing. Um, when, uh, so sorry about that. Uh, when I went to um, Idaho for a genealogy project that my husband was working on and um, people in Idaho were like, what are you doing here? Why is there a black person here? We have so many questions. Uh, so what does this have to do with librarianship? Well, we are before the birth period. We are right after we get those babies in at zero to 18 months. And I want librarians, and especially story time librarians, to realize the immense power that you have to help prepare people um, as their kids grow up uh, in society and they get ready for those preschool and kindergarten kids where they're going to interact with um, others. Uh, and so I had a um, story time parent uh, um, send me a message about how our instructors enabled her kid to thrive um, in preschool and, and um, kindergarten with giving her the confidence and the skills to not only socially interact, um, but also uh, be engaged with the literacy aspect. So I want to I want uh, all the librarians to realize that you have such a great responsibility and a tremendous power um, in making sure that kids um, are built for empathy and for celebrating the differences um, of others. And uh, um, I will, I'm gonna further talk uh, about a race and age exercise workshop that I was always a part of um, that I think will help uh, preface um, the whole talk about uh, race and story time. Um, and this was um, part of an exercise from the book, How to Be Black, um, by Baratunde Thurston that the facilitator did. And so she had everyone, it was about a group of 50, um, equally split between um, people of color and white people. And she had us write on a piece of paper how old we were when we realized what, we, what race we were, and uh, one word to describe that. And then she gave us a few minutes to do that. And then we were to line up starting from you know, zero all the way to college. Um, and I'm not kidding you, but all of the people of color, we were between the ages of three and six. That is where we were at the front half of the room. Um, and our counterparts were, uh, a lot of them expressed like they didn't realize how they fit in until high school, if they took a class, um, until college. Uh, and so it was very much a big difference between um, people of color having very visceral reactions um, when they found out what race they were. And then um, our counterparts, like, it wasn't really a big deal to us unless, like, we went and sought it out or wanted to figure out what we had to do um, uh, to find out how we fit into the world. Um, and so we all found this just quite uh, interesting um, because I remember my own visceral reaction. I was in um, kindergarten and invited um, the class to my birthday party and no one came. And I remember my mom uh, with her hands on the steering wheel, she's driving me home as I'm like, I asked everybody, how come they wouldn't come? And, you know, uh, Jimmy or whatever said uh, that I lived in a really bad neighborhood. And so, um, I was asking my mom, what does that mean? I live in a bad neighborhood. Like, I'm fine, you're fine. Uh, and so then she had to talk about code words for like, I live in a very black uh, neighborhood and area. Um, and so everyone was afraid of coming. 
So just to reiterate that, um, that as a professional, you have this um, amazing responsibility that can help you properly model, uh, just like we do on literacy, on race observation. So we can create inclusive environments where we are fostering appropriately aged dialogue about humanity and like legit science. Like we are all born with different skin tone colors. There was like nothing magical about, um, uh, you know, like melanin and, and pigment um, or any of those uh, crazy um, stereotypes or or racist um, jokes that people um, will make about people of color. Um, so we should be celebrating those differences. So when um, our uh, story time attendees are school age and they are curious um, that they are not unintentionally hurtful to someone's feelings because they're just repeating what they heard um, or what uh, they overheard uh, or they aren't immediately shut down if they do have an embarrassing observation. And so what I noticed is um, when I started delving deeper into this is that there were two types of race models. Um, a lot of caretakers had this osmosis take of it where they wanted to surround their kid with diversity. We go out and we eat at diverse places. Um, we have tons of diverse friends. Uh, you know, we do all this stuff to make sure that they are immersed in diversity, but they never talk about that um, immersion. And then the other uh, model that I started noticing was the avoider model where um, the conversation would be like oh my child is too innocent like I can't believe they would say something like that they we just don't you know we just don't talk about it um, that's not they're not old enough to understand um, and neither one of those models work um, because the immersion model while that's great um, how does the kid not know that um, different doesn't mean weird because we don't do that at home that's weird uh, and then for the avoider um, it is crazy to me how people will let their kids like develop um, their own thought process that is just not true. Um, and for example, I had a staff person that said I could share this story. She was a nanny and um, she nannied two kids who were at that age where they were starting to ask those um, race related observation questions. And uh, the parents took her aside and was like, please just don't answer them, shut them down. We just, we just don't talk about things like that. So she overheard them in the store when they were pointing out brown people that they were out loud wondering is if, if it was the sun that burns them or how come they're so dark. And so that's like ignorance that we can champion and fight um, and empower caretakers that there is nothing wrong um, to celebrate uh, how we are different in a very true and compassionate way. Um, and the last thing is challenging those stereotypes. Um, just like people champion gender stereotypes. So um, if you read about all male inventors, you want to talk about how that's unfair because they were women inventors. And that's the same thing with um, people of color. So if you are reading um, books, are you making sure that you're portraying um, a well-rounded model? Are your characters uh, for black people? Are the, we just sports or entertainers or musicians and civil rights activists? Are you um, just portraying stories of just regular black families like in Jabari Jumps or Max and the Tag Along Moon or and I think it's uh, Connie Morris and Schofield's like I Got the Rhythm. Um, so that takes us to um, the biggest issue with uh, going into this talk on on how we can talk about race is making sure um, that you're careful how you model. So we talk about story time transitions uh, and how like we have these parent tips um, for parents and caretakers to learn about how they can enhance building independent readers. So raising socially conscious kids good citizens, empathetic people is you're doing that in the same way. You can bring up these points naturally in a non-preachy, non-checklist way. And um, this isn't something that is supposed to be like, this is my good deed of the story time universe of the day, or it shouldn't feel like, oh my God, this is another thing I have to remember. It shouldn't be detracting from story time at all. Uh, as a story time librarian, I haven't missed a beat when pointing out features to kids or she Sharing with caretakers race-related observations and interacting with their kids and I've observed my librarians and library assistants story timers do the same thing too. 
So before we get into the meat and bones of the presentation, I just want to take two minutes um, where I want you to think about your top 10 story time books. Uh, and what are your go-to story time research, resources, excuse me? And if you do um, picture walks, how are they included in race-related observations? So I'm gonna give you about two minutes um, to just have that time to think about it, uh, and then I'll jump right back in. All right, so I hope you took some time to think about that and just some follow-up questions. Um, so for the first one, with listing your top 10 story time books, so when you're thinking about that, how many of them are diverse? And how many of them are purely animals? And how many of them feature white children? And I have no problems with animals. Um, I completely understand the science behind it. It's just like oral story time, storytelling. Um, but I wanna make sure that if you have a diverse community, um, how many of those books represent or celebrate? And even if you don't, how many of those are giving your um, uh, your story time attendees a glance at that outside window um, and showing them uh, a a bigger world out there. And then for your resources, uh, do you ever compare if they're best lists of story time books with a diversity lens? And um, how often are you willing to um, try out um, a new diversity read uh, and then communicate that with your other staff um, and coworkers? And then are you sharing your knowledge with your coworkers um, or your managers about uh, anything that you learn surrounding diversity and inclusion? Um, and then do you mention race when you do a picture book walk um, as you read a story time? book. Uh, so I do hope that uh, you've thoughtfully answered these questions because uh, we all have room to grow and sometimes I feel that um, fear is just a super powerful motivator and it's so paralyzing um, that we have like all this doubt of this isn't going to go well if I try this um, or you know I 
it's, I'm going to make someone very uncomfortable if I talk about race and story time. But if we are ever going to have um, racial harmony in society, one of the things that you have to believe is that you have not only a personal but a professional responsibility to help um, achieve that goal. And that in eliminating that doubt, you can make, um, you can turn it on its head and um, think about making story times fun and affirming for for everyone that attends. And if you've never had to be conscious about race before, you can do it in this positive and meaningful way so that you are educating the next generation of police officers, of health professionals, of educators, and you're giving them the tools to overcome their bias starting um, uh, at zero. Uh, so now, we're going to get into um, the meat and bones of the presentation. And so I have a Google Doc folder link that I will be sharing um, halfway through where you can find um, everything that I'm about to talk about. Um, in that folder, there will be um, these parent tips. Uh, so if you do use that clothesline method, uh, you can print them out on eight by 11 cardstock. Um, there are baby toddler and preschool lesson plan examples where you can insert that give you examples of where you can insert those parent tips. Um, there's a book list of recommended books for each age group that also has talking points with them. Um, there's a microaggression sheet if you are having trouble with tone or if you need a refresher, um, and it also helps with training. And then there's a steps to success talking point sheet and uh, a coaching uh, staff talking point sheet as well. Um, so we're gonna get right into it with the baby parent tips and the toddler parent tips. So these are examples that we hang on our clothesline. Uh, and then when we do different books, which I'll show on the next slide, um, we use these as either transition into the books or we use them um, as beginning uh, transitions when we do picture book um, walks. And we have other ones that we did not, that I did not include in as examples, um, one of the main ones being that we make sure that our caretakers know that they need to respect their child's curiosity of the world around them by answering their hard and sometimes embarrassing observation. And let me think of it. Let me think about that for a while. Or that is a good question. I don't know. Are all great responses. Um, so how we would use those tips. Um, is so for example, if we are doing a, at baby time a shared reading of whose knees are these, um, we would point out like, can you find your baby's knees? Um, can you touch your baby's knees? Um, are your baby's knees darker, lighter than this baby's knees? And then we say, um, this baby's knees, they're brown. And so it is really, um, exciting that we are all born different and so then we go on and uh and we go through and read the books and then we'll do um i love my people for toddler time um because i think it's a perfect introduction to the vast um and amazing physical differences um and and beautiful celebration um of of how black people look. And so I feel like it's just this great example um, for caretakers to just see how um, different we are in age um, and skin tone. He does a great job with his photographs. Um, and then these hands, I love to use the fair and unfair for preschoolers because they completely get that. And so, you know, we talk about how this grandfather um, couldn't use his hands to do everything. And so is that fair or unfair? And then we talk about at that time, there were unfair laws um, that uh, 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 disadvantaged a group of people, African Americans um, at this time. And so um, in that Google Drive folder, you'll get more books that um, uh, are perfect for um, uh, introducing uh, race-related observations. And so um, there are plenty more amazing and great uh, books that have been published uh, in recent years. And when we started transitioning to these race talks, our early literacy committee made sure that we updated all of our story time then. So if there were shared reading, then all of our story time instructors were getting whose needs are these. 
um, you know, we did a mass overhaul of all of our like story time book bins to make sure that we are supporting these race talks and that, um, it's one thing to say like, oh, we're going to do this. And it's another thing um, to, make, to make sure that we put our money where our mouth is and that everyone has these, um, that everyone has a um, more updated uh, resources at their disposal that they can use. Um, and so then it cuts down on the excuses of, oh, that book was on hold, um, or, you know, like too many people want that book, I can't ever find it. So we wanted to make sure that um, we are equipping our storytime librarians for success. Um, so um, steps to successfully um, talk about race. Um, and I'm going to circle back a little bit to the natural flow um, and that this isn't a beat down <laughs> where I've had librarians take um, this stuff literally that they're like, oh, you know, this isn't going to be fun because we have to point out every little thing and we have to make sure like, is everyone getting that we are all different instead of addressing it in a very relaxed and unselfconscious way. So what you're trying to express to your community and advocate is that the library celebrates diversity because it's one thing to have marketing and advertisement, whether it's clip art or photographs that you are diverse um, library, but it's another thing if I'm coming into your library and I've never actually um, see a program or anything that's relating to um, any type of diversity celebration. So there are simple ways that you can advocate to parents um, that inclusion and diversity is to be celebrated. Um, and the first thing is making sure that you're authentic. Um, and that, uh, you know, you're affirming these racial differences. Um, you know, look at this baby on the cover. It has brown skin. You know, what color is your skin? Um, it's amazing that we all have different color skin. Um, and then, you know, you're making sure that you're letting parents know that it's okay to point out racial differences um, in books uh, from babies to teens. And then, of course, there's age-appropriate dialogue about it, but that's completely okay. Um, and so you want to make sure that you're very intentional about how you're doing these race-related conversations in your story time. Um, and then again, back to the advocacy, you want to make sure you have wording or verbiage around your inclusion and diversity. So for example, a lot of times when I started off a story time session, I just let caretakers know right away that my story time is about celebrate everyday diversity and the community. And so, you know, you can let them know like, hey, we celebrate books that reflect, um, you know, the multifaceted community uh, in the city that we live in. Or, you know, you can advocate for inclusion, again, by letting them know that, you know, not only do we talk about tips to make your kid a better reader, but we're also developing empathy and compassion by celebrating race-related observations. Um, so there are different ways that you can um, set up your story time for success. Um, um, and make it seem like this just this is a natural part of life um, and not like oh you know I went to this diversity training and they're making us do this now um, so I want to encourage you that there are ways that this doesn't have to seem um, a very foreign um, it should just be a part of uh, who you are as a story time librarian um, so then the biggest question is um, how do you get buy-in from staff and management? And so I want to let you know that I was not head of youth services um, when I was a story time instructor uh, and I was a branch manager that went to the head of YS at that time and presented the tools that I would develop, let her know the documentation of how I like did this on in my own community and have been doing it um, forever and felt that it was something that I wanted to make sure that all of our instructors um, we're engaged with and helping move our institute forward um, and making sure that we are, whether it's culturally competent or have a social justice focus. Um, but I wanted to make sure all of our story time instructors were on board. 
So this is something that you can do whether you are just a regular librarian or you are um, a manager. So moving forward, um, we had a mixed group of, of librarians. Some people are always very responsive to change and other people, it just takes a while for change to happen. Um, so if you are working with a mixed pot of reactions, the first thing you need to do is uh, just expect numerous meetings and you want people to talk it all out. So you need to find out where everyone stands, even if you feel it's hurtful or unhelpful. So you have to divorce yourself from your first innate reaction um, of like, oh my goodness, I can't believe this person thinks this into like about the, the whole big picture. Like, how do I help this person move from thinking this to see like, you know, how amazing um, uh, this is if they help in facilitating um, this process. So you want to make sure that you listen to them and that they feel heard and you want to talk about um, address all their concerns. If they feel awkward about it, um, you know, talk about that awkwardness. Um, you can always circle back to remind them that just the way that they, they practice um, uh, their regular story times, whether it's singing or rhymes or, or the story itself, you know, they can practice adding these parent tips. Um, if it's, if they're afraid of microaggressions, um, that's something where you can either bring someone in for a microaggression training if you have that power, or you can sit with that hands out um, and talk through that. Um, a lot of people were afraid of racial terminology. Is it okay to say this? I don't know. Um, and I know that it seems frustrating if you're like, oh, you're all librarians, you should just research that. But some people are still afraid, even if I read this, how do I know <laughs> this is true? Um, and so it seems funny, but, but it really isn't. Um, and so you wanna make sure that you know if your institution, like for example, ours um, went from, they were moving away from Hispanic, Latino, Latina, and they wanted to make sure everything is Latinx. So, does your staff know that? And um, making sure that you discuss all the racial terminology um, is super important. Um, and then making sure it's done in a judgment-free zone. Because um, this is the time that it's great to practice not being biased at your own coworkers. Because again, you're trying to um, make sure that they can achieve this higher goal and being empathetic and compassionate and celebrating differences. So again, you want to talk it all out and then you want to stress practicing um, first is practicing the flow what they'll say how they'll say it and then you want to give them examples and model those examples so you know I had brought um, one of the picture books and so everyone had it and so I stood up at the front and then you can go around to see um, if everyone's comfortable if people don't want to do that and they need time then that's okay but you want to make sure that they're seeing it done uh, and see it modeled um, in, in those meetings. And then tone, um, you know, call out if uh, they're not buying what you're selling. And you can do that in a very tactful way. Um, if they feel like this is an exercise or a diversity training that, you know, they're making us do this now, then your community is not going to buy it. And, you know, the story times are going to be really awkward and then it's not ever going to be used. Um, so the thing is, you want these tools to be used and um, helping your staff and training that um, is just essential in the practice process. Uh, and then you want to reassure everyone uh, that um, if you can, with the head of youth services, develop institutional support language. Um, our head of youth services called it your go-to phrase, because a lot of people um, are afraid of going back to that fear um, is a really strong motivator to not do something, that if they say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing, they're going to get in trouble and they're going to get fired. So you want to reassure them whether it's the head of youth services develop um, language around that, like we, it's really important to us to uh, support our community by providing them um, with the resources where they can see themselves reflected, um, or it's just we just celebrate diversity. 
Uh, and so you want to make sure that people know that um, the institution will support them uh, and reassure them that, uh, you know, if they do have to have a tough conversation with the caretaker that they can come back um, to either get coaching on that or that they can um, feel free to, to try to process that. And then if there's a way to give them feedback, so next time, you know, how can I help you um, not uh, get into the situation then that you have that room to do so. Um, and so then the best part or my favorite part is um, having tangible next steps. So again, you can present the material and you can talk about it until you are blue in the face, but if no one actually uses the materials, then it's a moot point. So um, you have to have concrete goals or next steps uh, for everyone to follow. So for people that were brand new um, to the Let's Talk About Race, um, the first thing that we had them do is that um, if we usually have 10 to 12 week sessions, um, it was mandatory during those sessions that they highlight at least three to four illustrators or authors of color. So a lot of our caretakers, they have no idea that um, non, uh, that people of color uh, illustrate or write picture books. Um, so to me, there, um, if you as a story time instructor can hold up the lion and the mouse and say, you know, Jerry Pickney is an African American um, illustrator or Kadir Nelson, um, that should just be a natural or highlighting Asian American um, uh, illustrators and our authors. So that was the first thing that we did um, is making sure that people feel supported where we're moving them forward. But first it's acknowledging um, that we have diverse uh, authors and illustrators. And then um, from that on to when we did our next session of story times, it was moving all the baby time instructors that they had to use one let's related and um, let's talk about race parent tip. Um, and so we had have it um, we have like eight locations uh, so I'm always popping up to um, uh, observe story times and making sure that I'm working with um, direct supervisors so that they know what to expect if they have to go observe story times um, so giving your staff concrete steps um, make sure that this is something that you can all move forward um, within a very cohesive and natural way uh -huh. So that uh, leads me to um, uh, having the tough conversations um, with caretakers. Uh, so I live in Grand Rapids, which has a super high Dutch Christian um, reform population. Uh, and so we wanted to make sure that our staff was um, equipped with dealing with um, upset caretakers. Um, so the first thing we do with staff and coaching them um, is talk about our customer service policy um, because this is no different treating an upset caretaker is to me no different than treating an upset patron um, so you remain calm you listen to them um, you make sure that they feel that they're being heard um, and you're empathetic to their concerns um, and then uh, if your library has a inclusion and diversity collection policy you can use that verbiage if um, it's a it's if you're addressing a book um, you can piggyback on that. Um, again, you can uh, have your go-to story time advocacy phrases. You know, I strongly believe in celebrating and affirming diversity in our community. And then um, sometimes I delicately remind them uh, that I am um, uh, using age appropriate books. Um, so like These Hands or I Too Am America, that's completely appropriate for toddler and preschool ages. So if someone um, did get upset, uh, I usually let them know that I'm not talking about the nuances of slavery and the violation of physical um, bodies or rape or assault. And I know those are extreme, but sometimes reminding them that they're not teens, like this is a teenage conversation that we're having, um, we're discussing age appropriate um, material. Um, it does help calm down uh, someone if you do it in the right way. So again, you have to do that um, in a delicate uh, manner. Um, but from my experience, from my observations, if anything, um, when we have these talks, it helps break the ice with our community that we have a lot of parents see us as experts of books. 
So then they want to come um, and talk to us about, hey, can you recommend books on this subject? Or I'm having a hard time on this topic. Or I really want to raise my kids to make sure that they, um, you know, are good people and I don't want them to be um, racist. So uh, what would you advise? And I'm saying that this is not only as a black librarian, but I've had white librarian counterparts as well. So honestly, we have not had um, the huge fear of like someone's going to be really upset and talk to me. Um, we that for every 10 positive reactions, we've only had one upset person. Um, so I hope that gives you the tools that you need to um, start facilitating in case that is a huge fear that someone's going to be upset at you. Um, and then just remember that, that your people of color and the audience, um, I have not had them say one um, disparaging remark. If anything, they have been very thankful um, that they get to see themselves um, in this public space. Uh, so I have left um, enough time for questions because uh, I wanted to sum up with uh, um, some sources that I've included um, in this presentation, which can also be found on the Google Drive folder. Um, and uh, longer, I have some simplified sources on this slide, but I have longer sources on um, in the actual folder. But I, I want us to be a better society. And so I know Fred Hampton said, we can fight racism, not with racism, but with solidarity. So the work that you're doing in story time on um, talking about race is solidarity work. And so part of doing solidarity, solidarity work is figuring out how to disrupt biases. And that's what you're providing your caretakers with and your story time uh, families with. And so um, you have those tools um, to help disrupt those biases. And I know Alex Haley said that racism is taught and not an automatic behavior. Racism is taught in our characteristics, or I'm sorry, it is a learned behavior toward persons with dissimilar physical characteristics. So you are empowering families and children that they do not have to automatically learn to embrace ignorance and fear. And then I'm going to leave you with uh, an amazing quote from um, Audre Lorde that it is not our differences that divide us. It is our inability to recognize, accept, and celebrate those differences. Um, so I do hope that you're able to take um, what I've talked about to celebrate those differences in your story time. Um, so if you want to look for, for, for further materials, um, you can in that Google um, Drive link. So I will stop um, the presentation to spit that link out at you and then uh, answer questions. So Jessica, once you get the link sent, I'm just gonna go back and read the few questions that have come in during your talk, which, um, and this may be taken care of in the link. The first question was, what was the title of the book about the Great Migration? And later on, someone was hoping that you might provide a list of the books that they, you were mentioning all sorts of great books that they wanted to read, and they weren't writing them down fast enough. So I don't know if that link is in the Google Drive, but, but if not, I said in the chat that if you could, if it isn't in the Google Drive and you wouldn't mind sending me a list of the books that you mentioned when we send out a link to the recording I'll I'll include that with it Sure. So um, I sent the link out. Hopefully everyone's able to access that. Um, so all the books I mentioned, um, there is a document called um, Steps to Success Digging Deeper, and it has it broken down videos, blogs, websites, books. Um, so all of those books um, from The Warmth of Other Suns by Isabel Wilkerson. Sorry about that. I had my timer on. Uh, Warmth of Other Suns by um, Isabel Wilkerson uh, to um, the in the wake of Brown's legacy, uh, they should all be listed there. Um, I will definitely make sure you have that document, no, no, so you can send that out as well um, in case uh, for some reason people cannot access that. Okay, sorry, I had my mic off and my controls disappeared. So, was the document in the Google? Drive. I'm sort of having various things pop up on my screen. Yes, so, it is in the Google Drive. Um, I am exiting and, out. And, to... 
and what what was it called again, Jessica? Because I'll make sure that link goes out with. Sure. Well, actually, um, I could just send out the link to the to your Google Drive. How about if I do that? Correct. That Google way. folder. It's called Steps to Success: Digging Deeper. Um, okay. And then under books, it should have um, all of the books that um, I've listed, The Warmth of Other Suns, In Brown's Wake, How to Be Black, um, The Nurture Shock, uh, if I'm missing any of adult, adult titles, <laughs> um, I'll make sure I do another um, perusal of that. But it should have at least all the adult books on there. Um, and then any of the websites that I listed, the implicit Harvard bias or any of the blog posts should also be listed under there as well. Um, I really appreciate you put together this great resource. That's a wonderful follow up for, for everybody because I know there were a lot of people were really excited about it during the presentation and you know wanting to get those specific tips. So this is great. This gives people something to, to dig into and to share with their, with their um, co-workers and other staff members so that's wonderful um, I just saw let's see here's the, I you can probably see the chat questions can't you coming in I sure. know I got you got a comment of this is so amazing <laughs> and um, you also Betha wonder do you have suggestions for encouraging diverse families to attend story time well, that's sure. an interesting question. um so yes um uh, you can I always, call, I always call it like cold calling in a way, um, in a community engagement way. So for example, we have a um, pride center that has, um, they do a family time. So um, a lot of times people are so worried about um, if their families will feel affirmed and, and um, welcomed in the library, that they res they will go to safe spaces, of course, that's what we talk about. Um, so I worked with um, having uh, the Pride Center um, come to my branch at the time um, to give them that space where we introduce them to uh, what our story times um, are like, and um, they would feel, a, you know, safety in numbers, they'll have a ton of those families, and then making sure that my staff realizes that this is a really big deal and it's important for community engagement. And so from that, that helped inspire like, families to come on their own because they know that they will be welcomed in story time. So sometimes meeting people where they're at, um, whether you're doing pop-up story times at preschools and daycares where you know diverse families are attending um, will help um, facilitate that conversation that we are a welcoming and open library. Yes, I do use caretaker tips for story time outreach as well. I might not bring them like on the card sock because I'm not going to have a clothesline. Um, <laughs> but I will um, make sure that if if I do bring um, a book that I um, that represents my community, that I also bring a tip as well to model that inclusion and empathy. Oh, well, thank you. That was really nice. <laughs> it shouldn't be scary. <laughs> That's what um, I feel like uh, my uh, librarians of color who are all do story times. This is just what we do naturally. So we want to make sure that um, it's equipped that whether um, you're a person of color or you're a white person that you should be able to make race related observation in a very natural way. So yay. Thank you. Um, I have not for child care facilities, no. Um, I am just on my my regular library people. I have enough um, <laughs> with just making sure my librarians and library assistants are, um, are comfortable and supported, so I have not branched out to um, child care facilities. Uh, if I hopefully get more time, that is a great idea. Thank you, April. <laughs> oh, um, and Jessica, Jeremy um, just put in a thing. We wondered if it's all right to sh when we put up the archive of the webinar to also include the link to your resources. Yes, that's perfect. Okay. Um, they're out there to be used and shared. Okay, great. I figured as much, but it's always good to ask. Yes, <laughs> that's so great.
great. <laughs> um, oh, yay. I'm uh, excited that you do pop-up story times at daycares. Thank you. Is it Janine Miller? How are you? Ah, that's awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Kendra. This has just been great, Jessica. I really appreciate you taking your time to do this for us. And I know that this is, I mean, I don't, I don't think I've ever seen this many live attendees since we've been doing, doing these. And I know that the, the recording will be viewed over and over again. So this is really wonderful. And I so appreciate it. And then just yeah. to um, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, Emily, the civil rights link I noticed did not work. I realized that when I was looking through and I went to the Wayback Machine and archived it. Um, and then I forgot to drop that into the um, into the link. So I will go back to update that. Thank you for bringing that up because I had started that process and never finished updating that. Sorry. No, no. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Did you just read this? You're getting some great comments. We saw from Ann Harris said, you've inspired me. I'm working on a new presentation for early childhood educators, and now I want to totally change my focus and present everything you just said. So it's just great. I think you've, you've really inspired a lot of people with this. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I was just going to put in one quick plug that for the people who are here that if you see that survey come up, it should take you no more than a minute. It's just four questions and it's for our own IMLS um, information gathering that we, we are required to do. So we'd really appreciate it. Oh, someone said, how do we get access to the resources? I don't see a link to the Google Drive. It should be further up in the chat. Um, and when we send out a link to the record, oh, Jessica put it in again. When we send out a link to the recording, we'll also include a link to the Google Drive. Um, Sarah and Are there any more questions for Jessica? <laughs> more from Jessica, all right. <laughs> I, think, I think you're a new star, Jessica. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, I don't, I don't have much more than that for today. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks everyone for coming. Oh, move here. You move to Washington. We have, we have a nice state out here. You know, you could consider it. <laughs> thank you everyone. And especially thank you, Jessica. I really appreciate your time. It's been, it's been great. And like I said, I know that this is going to, you are going to really influence a lot of people and, and I hope that we'll all make some changes in our story time. So. Yes. And for those of you who are still here, we will be sending out the link hopefully later today. We have to do a little video editing upload and then you should get that this afternoon, I hope. Thank you for coming everyone.